So we are at church, and church means opening our Bibles. So turn your, oh, in your Bible to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. If you've got a Bible from an usher, that is page 862 in those Bibles that we give away, 862 Jonah chapter 3. Now, uh, while you're turning there, if you've got a Bible today, um, keep it. We don't need it. We don't want it. It's yours. It's our gift to you. Write your name in it. Keep it. It's, it's, uh, it's our gift. We love you and we, we want you to have God's word. And so, uh, and also the secret is, is that every sermon we tell you the page numbers. And so you'll be able to follow along that way. So as you are turning to Jonah chapter three, as you can see on the screen, we're in a series on revival. And what happens in Jonah chapter three is uh, one of the greatest revivals, if not the greatest revival in history. So it is critical that we see this revival as we are in our study on revivals. And so uh, if you are able, and if you are there, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? Jonah chapter three, starting in verse one. This is God's word for us this morning. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. As God's word, you may be seated. And as you are, join me in prayer. God, Jonah is a story that kids who grow up in church know a whole bunch about because of a fish, a really big fish. But that is a very minor detail in this book compared to what happens here in chapter three. So I pray that you would help us understand this word. And I pray that beyond understanding it, that you would help us understand how to apply it to our lives that we would see ourselves in this text. And then we, beyond that, that we would, we would come from this text standing in awe of you, our, our great God. And Father, I, I want to pray the same exact thing for Lifelink Church. I know their service is going to be, their second one is starting in about 15 minutes from now. I pray that you would bless Pastor David, that you would bless his preaching, that you would use it powerfully, just like I prayed for us that people would understand your truth and live in light of your truth and stand in awe of the God of truth as a result of their time at LifeLink today. Please do that there. Please do those things here, I pray, for the good of all of the people that will hear your word there and here. And do it, please, for the glory of your name. Amen. So I've got a question to get us started. Raise your hand if you are encouraged by all of the peace, love, and unity you're seeing in our world right now. I don't see any hands. Raise your hand if watching the news is really cheering you up these days. No? When we were doing our pastoral prayer time this Wednesday, and uh, if you were on Facebook Live and you're watching that, you know that multiple times we prayed for revival. We prayed for a, a national turning to God. We, we're seeing it from Christians. We're seeing it from Christian leaders that what our country need, what, what our world needs is revival. There's this growing sense that, that a national turning to God in repentance is the only thing that's going to keep our country from tearing itself apart. Politicians aren't going to do it. Many of them are enjoying what's going on right now. Businesses aren't going to do it. They're going to try to profit from it. 
Activists aren't gonna do it. They're, they're gonna ignite more of it. And, and much of the church so far, it seems, uh, tragically, it seems really not to care. We need revival, revival in our nation, revival around the world. And, and many Christians, we need revival in our own lives. Revival in the Bible is used for God's people. Revival means, means uh, life again. So there's already spiritual life there, but the embers have grown cold. There's, there's been a, a, a disinterest, a complacency, an apathy that set in, and more fire, more fuel needs to be added so the fire of, of commitment to Christ grows. That's the, the definition of revival in the Bible, but when it's used in, in church history, when it's used in historical context, the word revival refers to massive amounts of people Turning, for turning from their sins and turning to Christ for salvation. Many of the revivals in history happened in places where people thought that, that they were saved, when the mass of the population thought that we're, we're, uh, we're living under God's favor. They thought they were going to heaven when they die, only to five, find out in revival that they really weren't. The Ninevites had a completely different religion than the Jews, but like, but like any ancient uh, world superpower, they believed they had God's favor. Look at all these countries, these, these kingdoms that we've overthrown. Look at all these enemies we've defeated. Look at all the wealth that we have. They, they would have looked at all of that and said, our gods are with us. Our gods are favoring us. So the day that Jonah walks through the gates of the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian empire, and begins preaching God's message to them, they could have contradicted him and said, look at our wealth, look at our power. There's no way God is with us. The, the gods are favoring us. But instead of ignoring God's word, instead of disregarding God, they listened. They took it seriously. They, they repented of their sin and revival broke out. Again, the likes of which we have met, may have never seen before or since. So our gracious God puts passages like this in the Bible to show us that one of the distinguishing marks of revival is true repentance. We'll see this in the other revivals we look at in the coming weeks. And my interest in studying revivals is not so that we look at Jonah chapter three and go, oh, isn't that interesting? Make, make a couple observations, our heads grow a little bit, and then we all go home. Now, my interest in studying revival is that you experience revival, is that we, we experience revival. So like a spiritual doctor, my hope is that God will use this word to diagnose whether or not you need revival, whether or not your repentance has been sincere. We've been saying throughout this series that there's no revival without the word of God. And then we got more specific that there's no revival without the preaching of the word of God. Well, today we see one of the major effects of the preaching of the word of God in revival. Today we learn there is no revival without repentance. No one is saved without repentance. So asking for you personally, when were you saved? is the same as asking, when did you see the kind of repentance in your life that we're going to see in Jonah chapter three? As we will see, repentance is more than just feeling bad about your sin. It's more than saying you're sorry. It's more than regret or even doing some acts of punishment to, uh, to, to, to make yourself feel better. Matthew 7 says, not a few, but many will find out when they stand before Jesus that while they didn't lack good works, and they didn't lack right theology, what they lacked is repentance. And I don't want that for you. I want you to diagnose yourself and to say true repentance resides in my heart, but that diagnosis can't be based on your feelings and it, it can't be based on some rituals or religious ceremonies that you've gone through. The diagnosis of your repentance must be based on the truth of God's word. And when it is, when you can see your biography in the text and say, that has happened in my life just like it happened to the Ninevites, you will know true revival has taken place in my heart. And I pray that happens in many hearts. I pray that happens in tens of thousands, millions of hearts across our country and around our world. So take a look at verse three. Repentance that leads to revival is what we see in Jonah. And what we see in chapter three, verse three, and chapter four, verse 11, is the magnitude of the city. There are tens of thousands of people, and the point is to show us the magnitude of the miracle. This is one of the greatest, if not the greatest revival in history, and it comes through a reluctant, arrogant prophet who hated being there, which makes this even more of a miracle. The miracle that took place is seen in the vast numbers, tens of thousands, and it's, and it's also seen in the diversity of people. Look at verse uh, five. 
At the very end, from the greatest of them to the least of them. This was everybody, regardless of anything that separates us, revival was taking place and it was across every spectrum of person. What we see here is that there is no revival without sincere, genuine repentance. So if we're going to diagnose our repentance, if we're going to know if if our repentance is sincere as well, then point number one, we must identify the marks of true repentance. Identify the marks of true repentance. The end of chapter three gives us six characteristics, six marks of true repentance. This is what the Holy Spirit does in people's hearts through his word when there is genuine revival. Point number one, there is recognition. Recognition, verse five, notice, they believed Jonah's message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. They accepted that as a message from God and believed that it would happen. This shows this a kind of intellectual aspect of true repentance. They took the message seriously. They didn't rationalize it. They didn't explain it away. They, they didn't ignore it. They, they learned in that moment, God is watching. He is holy. He is good. And because of that, he hates our sin. They learned that God is just, meaning he must punish their sin. They learned that the judgment was sure, that judgment was right, and that judgment was unavoidable unless they repent. Second, there was contrition. See that in verses five to eight. They did three things. They fast, they put on sackcloth, and the king even sat in ashes. All of those three things have specific nuances, but they all come together to express sorrow for sin and regret and remorse and shame and humiliation. This shows a kind of emotional aspect of true repentance. Fasting shows a depth of sorrow. It shows that there's intensity to their desires. They're willing to forego normal comfort and impose suffering on themselves. This this is showing how genuine their repentance is. Sackcloth is the dress of mourning. So you would put sackcloth on if someone in your family died to show that you're mourning. So what are they mourning over? They're mourning over their sin. They're mourning over the fact that God is going to come and destroy them for their sins. And then sitting in ashes is is an act of shame and humiliation. Nobody sweeps out their their fireplace and, and puts the ashes in like a little thing and puts it on their mantle and goes, isn't that beautiful? It's trash, it's nothing. And, and here, the, here the, the king is getting off his throne and sitting in ash and going, I'm trash, I'm nothing, I deserve nothing. This is overwhelming regret and grief for sin. Third, there's desperation. Yes, it's seen in their fasting and their sackcloth, but note, did you hear in verses seven and eight, who else is supposed to join them in the fasting and the sackcloth? They're animals. Your dog can't eat. Your, your cow's got to put on this, this, this potato sack. You know, you got to put it on all of them and make sure that, that, that they are showing that, that, that even their animals are repenting. The king just sees the hopeless situation. I, I think if, if they could put sackcloth on flies and, 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 and caterpillars, they would have done it. Just to, everything in our land, everything with breath is, is horrified at the coming judgment. This was a sign of utter desperation for mercy. This shows a kind of volitional aspect of repentance. The choices they're now making show the sincerity of their repentance. And remember, verse 7, they're not just supposed to fast food. What are they supposed to fast as well? Water. Water. Try that sometime. That's not easy. That's rough. And that is showing just how desperate they are. Nothing is going to hold them back, even water from begging, praying, God, be merciful to us, which is number four, supplication. The word supplication means intense asking, and we see that in verse eight, where it says, where the king says, call out mightily to God. This isn't half-hearted, mind somewhere else, pray some prayers and move on. This is with strength, with conviction. This is not wimpy. There's passionate zeal in their prayers. This is what true repentance leads to. I need to talk to God. I have to talk to him. I'm gonna do that instead of eating. I'm gonna shake off all indifference. All half-heartedness is gone and I'm just going to beg, head in the dirt, oh God, be merciful. That's because of number five, there's admission. Admission in chapter one, verse two. Notice it says there, that great city, call out against it for their evil has come up before me. So what is it that moved God? Uh, what, what is it that God saw in Nineveh that moved him? The answer is verse two, their evil. Well, how does the king describe their lives in chapter three, verse nine? 
Same word. Turn from his fierce anger that we may not perish. I'm sorry, verse 10, where it says, turn from their evil ways. And verse 9, verse 8, let everyone turn from his evil way. In other words, true repentance owns our sin. Notice what God says about them in chapter 1, verse 2, is how they describe themselves in chapter 3, verse 8. They're not rationalizing it. They're just admitting it. They're owning it. What God says about my life is what my life actually is. This is what true repentance does. It recognizes sin as sin. No more justification, no more excuses, no more hiding. Own it, admit it. This is confession, agreeing with God's assessment of my life and agreeing that his just, right, and good judgment for my sins is what should happen. God is justified in his anger. He's justified in wiping them off the face of the earth. They accept those consequences. Look at verse nine, who knows? We have this evil, we have this violence. Who knows, God may be gracious. It leads to dedication. Dedication, notice verse eight again. They start to own their evil. Notice in verse eight, they were to turn. They were to turn from their evil. Verse 10 says that, notice it says there how they turned from their evil. What's going on here is they went from doing evil to doing good, from doing wrong to doing right. They were dedicated to pleasing God. Some suggest, think about this, that taking off his robe and getting off the throne in verse six is the king saying, I'm not the king anymore. You're the king, Yahweh. You sit there, that's your seat. I don't belong on that throne, you belong there. Going through all these rituals, the fasting, the prayers, the sackcloth without really meaning it, that's not what's happening here. This is genuine dedication. This is, this is something that, that's actually changing them from the inside out. Repentance commits to end your rebellion against God and, and to give yourself to him as, as your God. He's no longer the man upstairs. He is your God, your master, your king. I want you to see this in the New Testament too. So keep your finger or your, your little ribbon there and uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you've got a Bible from an usher, that is page 1070. 1070. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. These six marks of true repentance are in the New Testament as well. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to call this church out on their sin. Well, how did they respond when their sin was exposed? He writes 1 Corinthians. He writes multiple letters, two of which we don't have, all to expose their sin. Well, how do they respond? Look at verse 9. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, as it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved by the letter that he sent them, but because you were grieved, notice, into repenting. You felt a godly grief so that you no, suffered no loss through us. In other words, you did not go down in our assessment of you because you did not respond to the, to the word of God in a way that showed you were faking repentance. Your repentance was legitimate. It was sincere. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. In other words, you don't, you don't regret true repentance because you're like, thank, thank God I'm rescued from all this stuff that was in my life. Thank God it's all out in the open now. Whereas worldly grief, though, that produces death. And now he describes what true repentance looks like. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. In every point you've proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So think about this. There was grief, right? We saw that multiple times, godly grief, but that, that grief or that contrition produced a desperation. Look at verse 11. First word is earnestness. There is a seriousness in them. They're not gonna hide. They're not gonna tolerate. They're not gonna excuse their sin anymore. They're going to own it. It produced an eagerness to clear themselves. Next, next phrase. They cried to God and, and they're dedicated to clearing that sin out of their lives. There's an eagerness to get all of this garbage out of their lives. It produced, next word, an indignation. They admitted their sin. They owned their sin so much that they hated it. They hated that they fell into it. They couldn't believe that it happened. They wanted it out of their lives. They, they were indignant about it, angry, 
at the sin. Next, notice, true repentance produced fear. A recognition that God's assessment of them was right. That he will punish them if they aren't saved or he will discipline them if they are, unless they repent. Next word, it produced a longing. Again, that's a desperation, a yearning to be right with God, a yearning to be right with others, a, a, a willingness to do whatever it takes to make that happen. It produced a zeal, a dedication, a commitment to obey. It produced, notice the last word is punishment. In other words, they accepted the consequences. They weren't trying to get out of it. They weren't trying to hide a certain thing so, so that they would mitigate the punishment. No, they were all in like, what, I will tell you anything and everything. I will get it all out. That is true repentance. And what does that prove about their life? Verse 10, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to what? Salvation. True repentance proved the people in this church were saved. Without those marks of true repentance, salvation is rightly questioned in a person. So turn back to Jonah 3 now. Did a deep dive into Jonah chapter 3, did a deep dive into 2 Corinthians 7, all of that to ask you this. Have you experienced true repentance in your life? Repentance is an essential non-negotiable of salvation. And for repentance to lead to salvation, it must be true repentance. True repentance will show itself. And recognizing God's assessment of your sin is true. It will recognize that the inevitability of your judgment and your need for grace is true. That doesn't happen without contrition, a brokenness before God. I've sinned against you. Remember, David, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is wicked in your sight. Without desperation, a seriousness about the predicament you're in before a holy and good God. I got to get out from under this. God, rescue me, save me. This will lead to admission, a confession, an owning. It'll lead to supplication, a crying out to God for mercy because of your sins and a dedication, a commitment to, to do away with your sin and to live for him. True repentance is actually seen in the difference between the Ninevites and Jonah. See, we, we read the story of Jonah and, and it typically ends in chapter three. We don't really get to chapter four when, when we're kids. But when you get to chapter four, you realize that, that Jonah hated the revival that broke out, right? He hated it. He couldn't believe it. How in the world could you be gracious to them? He's saying, well, that couldn't be any more opposite than the Ninevites. Chapter three is silent about Jonah's repentance because the big fish didn't cause repentance. He was sorry he got caught. He wanted to rethink his decision as he was drowning and about to die. The sailor, I'm sorry, the, the king and the Ninevites though, they respond with deference and obedience to God's assessment of the situation. Not in Jonah. He hated what God was doing. He ran away. They placed themselves under God as their master, Lord and King, not Jonah. God saves the Ninevites and Jonah hates it. He's, he's angry that God would do that. They expressed their hope that God would be merciful. Jonah hated that God was merciful. Look at verse four. You think, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse one. Look at chapter four, verse one. You would think after this revival, saving tens of thousands of people, that Jonah would be like, that is amazing, greatest revival ever. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry that God would be gracious. And notice he even says it. I prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and a merciful God, and I didn't want them to receive mercy. They allowed nothing to keep them from repentance, but not Jonah. His pride got in the way. When, when you have a better plan than God, that, that's called pride. They cried out to God for mercy to be spared from judgment. They showed signs of true repentance and a life dedicated to God. Jonah did not. The contrast between the Ninevites and Jonah could not be more obvious, but the, the question is, are the Ninevites also a contrast with you? Their evil and violence couldn't be any more different than our lives. The Assyrians were some of those most wicked. The things that they did on the battlefield is just beyond awful. Taliban times a thousand times a million. Their evil and violence couldn't be any more different than us, but what about their repentance? Nineveh recognized God's message about their sin, that God's coming judgment for their sins was right, and it was true. Have you? 
Nineveh, was, they were contrite. They were, they were broken over their sins. They're humiliated and humbled by their sins. Have you? Nineveh was desperate for mercy. They were desperate to just be right with God. Are you? Nineveh was not indifferent, but they begged him for mercy. Have you? Nineveh admitted, they exposed, they owned their sin. They, they owned that his judgment was coming for him and that that judgment for their sin was right. Have you? And Nineveh dedicated themselves to turning from their sin and following the Lord. Have you? This is true repentance. This is true for everyone who's ever been saved. And the book shows people who refuse to repent the insanity of that decision. If the Ninevites were that bad, and again, they were some of the worst in history. If they were that bad and God is that kind, why wouldn't you repent? Listen to me, I'll be at the, the, the middle doors back there after the service. There'll be other pastors roaming around. Please do not leave here. If God is working in your soul right now and causing you to wonder, am I saved? Have I experienced true repentance in my life? Please do not leave here without talking to one of us to make sure that when you leave here, you are right with God. Do not harden your heart in this moment. Allow God to work. The next question we're gonna look at is this, where did this repentance come from? What is the source? What is the root that produced the fruit of true repentance? The repentance in the Ninevites didn't start with the preaching of Jonah and it didn't start with Jonah's recommitment to God's will for his life. It didn't start with God rescuing Jonah. It didn't start, it started way before God ever showed up to talk to Jonah about going to Nineveh. So if you and I are going to diagnose the sincerity of our repentance, if people are going to experience the revival that comes from true repentance, we must, point number two, acknowledge the source of true repentance. Acknowledge the source of true repentance. Jonah chapter three shows us two sources, two points of origin for true repentance. And the first one is grace. Think about it. If you keep pushing the events back, you find that the repentance of the Ninevites started with the grace of God. It started before Jonah 1.1. It started in the heart of God where he saw the wickedness and instead of saying, I'm going to destroy them, he said, I'm going to send a prophet to them so they could be saved. There would be no repentance of the Ninevites without grace because there'd be no prophet in Nineveh without God's grace. There'd be no prophet in Nineveh without the prophet being rescued from certain death and then resent to Nineveh because of grace. There'd be no God running after Jonah without grace. There'd be no mission for Jonah to go to Nineveh if, it, if God was not a God of grace. Think about it. Grace is the source of true repentance. You find out that while God will punish your sin. He has also offered a way for you to escape from coming under his wrath because he's merciful, he's kind, he's compassionate. Repentance is a gift of God's grace. That's why Acts eleven eighteen 18 says that God grants, God gifts people repentance that leads to eternal life. Grace is the source of true repentance. This is God's compassion for sinners. He sees the, the, the unenviable and the, the, the relentless situation that we are in that we inescapably cannot get out of it. We cannot get away from God's wrath on our own. And he shows mercy instead. The only reason the Ninevites experienced what they did was because of the grace of God. God unites Jonah's words with the power of the Spirit to cause one of the greatest revivals in history. And like I said, even Jonah knew that what happened in, in Nineveh was because of the grace of God. That's why he was so angry in chapter four, verse two. I knew that you were a God of mercy. I knew that you were a God of grace. That's why I didn't want to come here. I wanted you to nuke that whole town. Jonah tells us that the source of the revival was grace. And second, the source of true repentance is seen in verse five, where it says, and the people of Nineveh believed God. The second source of repentance is faith. The Ninevites believed God. They accepted his word about them. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. But listen, faith comes first. We turn from our sins because we turn to Christ for salvation. We cannot divide repentance and faith, but we must distinguish them because there's no prerequisite. 
Because what happens when there's a prerequisite or, or when we think repentance comes first, then the question is always, have I repented enough? Have I, have I done enough to show just how, how sorry I am for my sin? But when faith comes first, it's no, my trust is in Christ. All my hope is in him. Forgiveness of sins, adoption, reconciliation uh, comes from there. All of that begins with faith. Jesus is trusted in, sins are forgiven. Repentance then the turning from sin is a fruit of faith. In other words, no one recognizes his sin, no one's broken over it, desperate for mercy, cries out to God for it, hates it, wants nothing more to do with it, turns away from sin as their master, unless they already believe. This is what we see in the Ninevites. What comes first, their repentance or faith? Notice verse five, they believe God, and then the fruit of repentance, the marks of repentance show up. Notice, they believe God in verse five, and then their lives change. Verse 10, they turned from their evil way. So a sinner must first trust in Christ, that he died for their sins, that his sins will be forgiven, that he'll be adopted into God's family and, ex and experience eternal life forever. And when that happens, sin goes from something that was fun and interesting to repulsive. I don't want that anymore because I want Christ, and that keeps me from him. In other words, it is the love of God that leads to love for God. It is the love of God that leads to love for God. We love God because God what? 1 John 4, 19. We love God because he first loved us. We're so amazed that this God who is good and right and just would love sinners. We, we don't have to clean ourselves up and make ourselves presentable to him. We'd be like Cinderella before, the, before the, the magic shows up. We'd just be in rags and dirty, but look how beautiful we are. God's going, no, not, not so much. It's not like the prince and, and Cinderella who, who loves her because of what she showed herself to be, at least at the beginning. God sees who we really are and loves us anyway, and that is grace. So if you don't see the marks of true repentance in your life, what, what should you do? You should acknowledge that God is being gracious to you right now. He's being gracious to you that you're able to hear this message about his grace. He's being gracious to you that there's a church here and a comfortable seat for you to sit in to hear the message of his grace. He's being gracious to you that we have a word, his word in our lap. We, he's being gracious to us that, that they used 40 different authors over 1,600 years to give us this, this book. Your being here now, listening to me, giving you the word is evidence of the grace of God operating in your life. Will you respond? Will you respond to that grace? Will you respond to him? How should you respond the same way the Ninevites did? They trusted in the message Jonah gave them. But notice chapter three, verse five, they went beyond that. It doesn't say they believed Jonah. What does it say? They believed God. They believed God. They entrusted themselves to him. They gave their lives to him. And so should you. That's the only kind of response that pleases God. Now, what is the 100% of the time guaranteed result of true repentance? Look at verse 10. Then God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. And God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Notice the order again. Verse 5, they believed God. They show the marks of true repentance, verses 5 to 9. And then God forgives their sins and turns from his judgment. So if you and I have diagnosed our repentance as, as being sincere, then we will, point number three, rejoice in the results of true repentance. If you've made it this far and you're going, God, it's not perfect, but I've seen these things in my life and, 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 and all of that is pointing me to the conclusion that, that, that I am a recipient of your grace and I am trusting Christ to save me. If you've made it this far, if you've seen these marks, that means you're not trusting in somebody else, you're not trusting in some organization, you're not trusting in some prophet, you are, you are trusting in Christ and Christ alone to save you. And if that's true, if that's the case, then rejoice in the two results that true repentance brings. The first is salvation. Salvation is the first result of true repentance. This is what happens in verse 10. The Ninevites are saved from the wrath that was coming after them for their sins. 
God sees the sincerity of their repentance, which showed the sincerity of their faith in him, and he forgives their sins. This is Luke 24, 47, speaks of, quote, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is Acts eleven eighteen 18 again, repentance that leads to eternal life. In God's mercy, God responds to genuine faith and true repentance with forgiveness. And then that, that punishment that we deserve for our sins, that punishment is transferred to Christ and what happened on the cross is done for you. Faith and repentance is, is the only response that leads to forgiveness for your sins like the Ninevites received. Religious rituals like baptism, that doesn't forgive. Dedications, rededications, that doesn't save. Good works don't please God unless those works are come from a heart that already believes and already is turned from sin. So there is the gospel, Jesus' perfect life, right? The, the life that he lived in perfect obedience to God. There's his substitutionary death, him taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins. There's his glorious resurrection. All of that is great news. But all of it means nothing unless you respond in the only way that saves, which is faith and repentance. Trusting in Christ and turning from trusting in yourself, turning from sin as your master and embracing Jesus as Lord. Which brings us to the second result of true repentance, which is transformation. Their lives actually changed. Verse 10, they turned from their evil way. True repentance cannot be in a person's life. Transferring your allegiance from yourself to Jesus, that cannot be in your life and not change your life. This is Acts 27, 26, 20. People perform deeds in keeping with their repentance. This is Matthew 3, 8. We are to bear fruit. We're to show evidence of our repentance. Think about it. Nobody can have these six marks of true repentance in their life without their lives being changed. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of ultimate loyalty where the sinner turns from self. I, I, I want God to bless my plans. I'm in charge and God, you've got to come alongside me and do what I want to say. I'm done with all of that. I'm not in charge here. I'm nothing. I take off my kingship and I, I sit in the trash and I go, God, I'm nothing. You're everything. Whatever you want, it's yours. My life is yours. Everything in my life is yours. And then the Christian life is one of continual repentance because God in his kindness continues to show us ways that we don't please him. And, and that's not meant to keep us in that despair of God. Why do I keep doing this? God, why, 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 why am I broken over sin? Here I am again. I was talking with a guy last night and he said, how do I, how do I get past the, the despair that I feel because of my sin? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't want you to get past it. I said, but here's what you're supposed to do with it. I said, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, it's, it's like pain in your body. Pain in your body tells you that something's wrong. I said that the pain that you feel, the spiritual pain you feel because of your sin, you're meant to, you're meant to feel that. You're, you're meant to hate it. You're meant to go, God, I, I hate this. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, but you were never meant to stay there. You were meant to take that to the cross. And you're meant to say, Jesus, I hate this, but you, you died for it. I've been washed from this. I've been cleaned from this. I, I confess it as sin. I'm not hiding it. I'm not rationalizing. I'm confessing it as sin. This is sin. And I said to them, what happens is that you receive forgiveness. And that forgiveness fills you with love for Christ. You can't believe that he would be so kind to you, knowing how sinful you are. And then from that uh, amazement, you, you begin to walk in, in newness of life and have some power over that sin. He's tears in his eyes. Thank you. Thank you. But that's the idea that the, that the Christian life is one of repentance. The Christian life is one of trusting in what Jesus did on the cross continually, not just one time and I move on. No, it's a continual life of repentance and a continual life of faith. I want you to see this in one more passage. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's page 1056 in the Bibles we give away. 1056. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's convenient. So I want you to see this paradigm for growth in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians church overcome by, by debauchery, sexual sin. And so he's, he's giving them encouragement to break free from that. And I want you to notice his final encouragement in verse 20. He says, for you... 
Well, go, go back up to verse 19. You are not your own. Why? Because you were bought with a price. That, that price was the death of Jesus. Since that's truth, and since Jesus purchased you with his blood, since you belong to him because of his death on the cross, notice, so glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body, that the salvation that we enjoy because of the death of Jesus is meant to lead to honoring God in our lives. Or the word that I've been using, transformation. Two results, salvation and transformation. That is what happens in revival. When one sinner is saved and their life is transformed, that's personal revival. When one saved person's life is further transformed, when they go from apathetic and really not caring and, and I know all of this stuff and all that to, to a fresh uh, a renewal of a commitment to God, that, that's personal revival. And when both of those things, salvation and transformation, happen on a massive scale, that's, that's a historic revival. But see, sadly, there are many people in church today who are deceived. They believe they can live however they want and still go to heaven without repentance. Oh, they prayed a prayer. They came forward in a service. They asked Jesus into their hearts, whatever that means, because that's not in the Bible. They fill out a commitment card to say, saying yes to Jesus. Again, whatever that means. They got baptized. They got confirmed. They had a warm, peaceful feeling come over them. That must mean they're saved, right? The deception is, is you can live however you want and still be saved on your way to heaven when you die without repentance. Look at verse 9. The truth is salvation will change your life. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, we're all unrighteous. Let's keep reading. Do not be deceived. The deception is the unrighteous can inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, the, the paradigm here is salvation transforms your life. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. An untransformed life, an unrepentant life, you will not go to heaven. But look at verse 11. And such, what's the next word? Were. Such were. Let that word sink in. Such were some of you. Notice, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If you've experienced that change, you know what I'm talking about. You know that there is a BCU and an AC after Christ you. That you look back at that person and you go, who was that? I don't even know who that was. Right? And that there's a sense that I'm, I'm a new creation. I'm a different person now. So if you've experienced that change, if, if looking at, at Jonah chapter 3 today has confirmed that your, your repentance is sincere, then the message today was for two reasons. One, it was to, so that you would rejoice. You've experienced true revival in your life. And second, that, that it, it equipped you so that if you know people who are like, I can live however I want and God forgives, so I'm going to do whatever I want. It doesn't matter because, you know, God will just be merciful to me. Ah, uh, no. No. But the issue there is one of repentance. You cannot live like the devil and think that you're going to go to heaven. You live like the devil, God forgives you, and then he changes you. It takes a while, it takes a long time, but there is a, a core, it's called a seed, the life of God living in your soul that begins to grow and grow and grow and push out the sin in our lives. That is a lifelong process, but it is a process that happens when we believe. You can help someone with that because you could take them to Jonah 3 or the cross references and, and you could show them like, hey, you, you need to see this. And also, if, if that's you, if you, you heard today and you're like, you know, I'm just so grateful for my salvation. I'm so grateful that, 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 that God would work in my heart. Then, then would you pray for more people to experience that revival? Can you start praying for revival here in Gilbert, here in Arizona, even around the world? And listen, I don't care if it, if it starts here. I don't care if this is the epicenter of the revival. Couldn't care less about that. I just want it to happen. 
We, if you've experienced that, you know like this is not one of those, that this is not the light that I cover in the bushel and just keep it to myself. I, I want everybody to know. I want everybody to experience what, what God has done in my life. So could you pray for that? Could, could you pray, God, do that here. Do that in Gilbert. Do that in Arizona. Do that around our world, God. We need revival. Revival transformed the Ninevites. Revival birthed hope in their hearts. Revival that transforms masses of our population here in America would, be, would give us hope that, that our, our world, our country is not going to tear itself in half. And by the way, that's another mark of genuine revival, not emotional enthusiasm or ecstatic utterances or mystical experiences, but God's people on their knees praying, really, truly supplicating, crying out mightily to the Lord. And if you've looked at Jonah chapter three and that's caused you to question the sincerity of your repentance, just listen, there is hope in a merciful God. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of mercy who will save you just like he did the Ninevites. He'll do it when you repent. And when he saves you, he will transform you just like he transformed the Ninevites. Listen, the Ninevites are more wicked than you are. The, the Ninevites are more violent than you are. The Ninevites are more surrendered to sin than you are. But will they respond more humbly to the mercy of God than you will? Will they respond more to God's grace than you will? Again, do not harden your hearts. Repent today. If there is anything in your life that is keeping you from coming to Christ and saying, I'm, I'm, uh, th this is a barrier, this is, that is what you need to get rid of. That is what you need to repent of. Why? Because nothing is better. Nothing is sweeter. Remember, Jesus is compared to a treasure hidden in a field. That the person who found the treasure goes home, sells everything he has just to have the treasure. That's, that is the Savior. That is Christ. Come to him and you will experience true revival. You will experience heaven touching earth as he transforms your soul. Let's pray.